This program is brought to you in part by the Eugenie and Joseph Jones Family Foundation, a local foundation proud to support education, the arts, and culture in the greater New Orleans area. Informed Sources is made possible in part by Susie and Pierre G. Villery. Quiet on the set. Soon we will all be more informed. We appreciate learning more of our region's news and public affairs. Cameras rolling. Hello, I'm Marcia Kavanaugh. Thanks so much for joining us. Well, in 1984, hopes were high that tourism generated by the newly opened World's Fair would help revive an economy suffering from an oil bust. Also, Edwin Edwards was on a roll serving his second of four terms as governor of Louisiana, but there would be a major challenge drawing global attention ahead. Hurricane Betsy, back in 1965, had been the worst recorded local weather event. By 84, a better levee system was being anticipated to prevent a future disaster. And the Saints, by then, in their 17th season, were still 26 years away from winning their biggest game ever. And in that year, Informed Sources made its debut using a reporter roundtable format influenced by an earlier Channel 12 public affairs program called City Desk. This year, the program celebrates its 40th anniversary, as we remember some of the biggest stories of its time, beginning with the World's Fair and including the Katrina recovery, the infamous Duke Edwards gubernatorial runoff, the volatile economy, and that night near Miami when coach Sean Payton hugged a trophy. Starting for us in the special edition are Errol Laborde, producer of Informed Sources, Stephanie Regal, staff writer, The Times Picayune, The New Orleans Advocate, Norman Robinson, retired anchor, WDSU TV Channel 6, and Dave Cohen, news director, WWL Radio. And I know we're going to have a great conversation and just a little bit of memory before we get going with it. Back in 1984, I was asked to start a program called Inform Sources. We named it Inform Sources. So we started back then, 1984, to do the reporter roundtable to try to give the reporters a chance to get a little bit more in-depth into their stories and thereby give the community even more information. And we've been doing it now for 40 years. And with me was Errol Laborde in those early, uh, those early months, too. You came on board um, doing, uh, you were appearing in Informed Sources at that time, and then, of course, you continued over all these years um, in producing. So 1984, the year of the World's Fair. So that was one of our big topics that, you know, we started with. So, E, you wanted to talk about and that. And another big issue was the Galleria, which was going to be built in Jefferson yeah, Parish. Uh, uh, yeah. And I remember that one of the reporters said, it's not going to be built. Okay, I mean, the politics just in there, it's not going to happen. So anyway, so we, we weren't always right. Uh, but the World's Fair was the dominant issue uh, by four, and there was just so much, there was so much ill feeling and, uh, and concern at that time. It was a dominating issue. But at the same time, there were new things going up in the skyline, too. Well, it really did change the use of the riverfront, too. It, that was a big effort at that time, was trying to redesign the use of the river. It was all, you sure. know, the warehouses around there, and people couldn't get to the river. And so it, it did bring the population, it was mostly local population, it wasn't enough, you know, no, uh, of international or national tourists, really, not that's as many the, as we planned on to come here. That's the biggest legacy, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That's the greatest legacy, isn't it, Errol? Yeah. Well, that it, it helped develop the riverfront. Yeah. Well, you, you know, when you talk about the World's Fair, the verdict is always the same. It was a financial failure, but the locals loved it. And then, and then over time, and then, and then over time, you can point to more and more things that are happening, including now. You know, with the yeah. new work that's, that's being done on on the Spanish Plaza. But you know, it's, it's happening around the world though that cities, port cities, river port cities, were changing because they didn't need to be a working industrial port anymore uh, because the way of sh the way shipping was changing and all that. And so, increasingly, they were trying to be a, a place of leisure. And that's what New Orleans is doing, too. But, I mean, before all that, the, the riverfront in New Orleans was a place full of warehouses and signs that said, do not trespass. Dot and wharves. Yeah. 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 yeah, locks and yeah. gates yeah. and fences. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and big rats. And, 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 and they want to make a difference. <laughs> Real big rats. <laughs> well, the, 
still uh, is. A, a couple of stories that come to mind, though, is that I remember the day before the World's Fair opened. It opened on, on a Saturday in, uh, in, in May, and they had a, a press preview. And so they invited press, local press all, uh, and, and national press that were there. And they walked around the fairgrounds, and it was a disaster. There were still uh, painters. There were still carpenters. There was still a lot of work being done. And, and it just looked terrible. And later that day, Peter Sperney, who was the rector, addressed the press, and he says, don't judge us by what you see today. Judge us by what you see tomorrow. All right. Well, that was almost unbelievable. And I remember walking through a press room where these radio guys were calling in the reports and saying, less than 24 hours before the World's Fair in New Orleans is going to open, it is nowhere near completion. And so that's the word that was, that, uh, that was getting out. What about the fact that, that it went bankrupt as the only World's Fair to ever go bankrupt? in the history of World Fairs. Well, you know, part of it is that the federal government really didn't support it. Uh, Ronald Reagan was president. Uh, uh, this probably became a Democrat-Republican thing because it was all Democrats in the world. Yeah. Okay. But uh, this is the first time a president never came to a World's Fair. Uh, they did have a shuttle that they, that they donated, but there was real no federal support. Also that year, like Epcot had just opened, I think, mm -hmm. like the year before. That's right. Well, there was the Olympics in Louisiana, mm -hmm. I mean, in, in, in Los, Los Angeles. Angeles. And so you had two events at different times of the country. Um, that were drawing people. And there was a documentary that was done by this station where Peter, many years later, where Peter Sperney was interviewed. And he said that, that when he interviewed for the job, the state gave him figures about what, what the tourism was mm -hmm. in Louisiana, and that encouraged him, and he said it was way off. I mean, what they said was almost double what the reality was. Well, it was not an economic success, that's for sure. But it, as you said, we here in the community, we loved it. I mean, I think we all have pictures back then when we had little children, and those of us who did at that time. We kept bringing those kids there for a wonderful time. I had so many pictures, I lost them in Katrina, of my kids just having a great time yeah. there and, and discovering the river. So it, it had, did leave some very positive memories. Oh, yeah, there were a lot of good things. It, it put the chicken dance on the map, okay? Uh, <laughs> yeah. We know about that. Well, and, and, and the development of the warehouse yeah. district, right, the exactly. convention yeah. center, I mean, the lasting yeah. well, legacy. Mm -hmm. Even the foot of Canal Street, you know, sure. would there be a yeah. casino at the foot of Canal right. Street? had there not been a World's right, Fair? Right. Would there be the hotels that are there? And that whole, you know, right. the revival of the central business yeah. district. Right. And would there be so. a convention center? Yeah, exactly. Had it not been for the exactly right. World's right. Fair. Well, well, the complex that includes Riverwalk today was the International Pavilion at yep, the time. Right. Mm -hmm. It was built with the understanding, we'll put the International Pavilion, but then we're going to rent it out to, like, I think the Rouse Corporation. So it, and it, so it did spur in a lot a of lot things. Of positive res residual Absolutely. effects and impact certainly to our community. So let's stay talking about the economy yeah. now, Stephanie. Let's go on. In these 40 years, we've seen ups and downs. We've seen a lot of ups and downs. And it's interesting to think back to 1984 because, I mean, up until that point, New Orleans had really been riding mm -hmm. a wave powered by oil and gas and all of the investment that that brought. And when you really think about those years and all of the major oil companies that had offices yeah. here, that were headquartered here, and the support services and the shipping companies, you had a, you had a city with companies like Tidewater and LL&E mm -hmm. and Likes Shipping. Mm -hmm. They were all based here. And as a result, you had large banks that were based here and large national and regional banks with their headquarters here, Hibernia and FNBC and Whitney and... And, and then in 1984, when oil prices crashed, or maybe it was 83, 84, 83, the 84. bottom just fell out. Mm. And really, we started a long, slow decline that in many ways, I don't think we've ever really recovered from. I mean, we've weathered ups and downs. We've, we've gotten out, but like we're never, we never really came back to the position sort of a prominence that we had been in in the late 70s, early 80s for a variety of reasons. Now, I mean, it, we, we have weathered the ups and downs, and I think where you've seen huge investments, in part, like, motivated by this World's Fair, uh, w is in the tourism mm -hmm. industry. And we, we built so much and put so many eggs in that basket, and that has grown, continued to grow. Um, after Katrina, of course, where we were devastated, you saw so much federal money came in, come in and you saw so many new investors and outside people bringing a sort of a new spirit of entrepreneurism to the community um, through the 90s and early 2000s as economic development and chamber of commerce types were trying to figure out how to grow. You saw a lot more regional cooperation sort of reaching across parish lines where traditionally we had been much more provincial mm -hmm. and that led to some fruits and you saw a lot more development 
development, say in Jefferson Parish and outlying areas. In the early 2000s, you saw the growth of the movie industry, which mm -hmm. I still believe had so much promise for this area and has bore some fruit, but for a variety of reasons, maybe because of the way the tax credit program was structured or whatnot, uh, in the, right? Well, and then the government. Well, it's always our politics that, that, <laughs> always our that politics, shoot us in the foot. Right? When you really, really look at it, <laughs> even to today now, you see um, investment and growth and huge promise in this focus of renewable energy, mm -hmm. all sorts of, uh, and, and of course the LNG, which depending on your position with respect to the energy and the mm -hmm. environment is, is maybe very controversial in Southwest Louisiana, but there, there's tremendous growth right now uh, throughout the state in the energy and renewables energy sector, whether you're talking about pure renewables like wind and solar mm -hmm. or these sort of quasi-renewables that environmentalists will tell you are not really renewable at all, but these cleaner fuels like green and blue hydrogens mm -hmm. and ammonias that can utilize existing industry infrastructure. And then there's the carbon capture. Well, and the carbon <laughs> capture is going to be a huge thing, too. Which never really happened with the emergence of East and New Orleans. There were so many, so many hopes and plans and all the thing when Misha was still there and, the, Glad you, and the, you, know, yeah. you know this big industrial area and, and it, it just never really materialized. Well, I think Even because, the park, because so much though of the development of New Orleans East was really predicated on this this idea that the oil and gas industry was going to continue to grow mm -hmm. and you saw so many engineer types and, and when a lot of the oil companies did expand mm -hmm. into the city in the 70s, that's when New Orleans East was really mm -hmm. developing. And when those companies moved out and took their people with them, to a lot of that, right? Yeah, to Houston. To Houston. And, 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 right? I mean, and those, Florida. And, and that's, yeah. that's when you saw those neighborhoods sort of collapse. That was the, that was the first nail in, in, the, in the coffin for New Orleans East, when they lost Mishu. Absolutely. When they lost the Mishu facility. And all the well, professionals and and all the highway people There's a revival moved there out. now. Yes. I mean, there's, yeah, there's a re but nothing, like nothing compared like, to no. what it was before. No, and with right. the death of the shuttle and yeah. mm -hmm. the new, yes. uh, mm -hmm. you know, plans. But they are building the crew capsules at Mishu yeah. now. Yes, they, they are they building are. the rockets. They're going to take astronauts back to right. the moon and hopefully to Mars. Uh, so there's some excitement there, but it's it's not nearly what it's it was. It's not enough, you know. And then losing the the, the plaza, right. the mall. That you know. was a huge thing. But also, what about population loss, too? You know, certainly Well, I mean, we, really, our that. population peaked in, like, around 1960, strictly Orleans Parish, you know, when we mm -hmm. had close to 700,000 people and were the 15th largest city in the United States. You know, by 2000, we were down to, to the 35th largest, and now we're somewhere around 40. So we have seen a gradual mm -hmm. decline, and relative to other places, the peer, the cities that were our peers, and I'm not talking about Houston. Houston hadn't been a peer in a long time, but places mm -hmm. like Birmingham and Nashville oh, yeah. right, are now so far ahead of us. Okay, so we'll, we'll just keep our fingers crossed that we will continue <laughs> to grow, like with these renewable um, energy sources, that that will provide a really big industry for us down the line, and increasing also with the movie industry. Um, although we are dependent on how the movie industry is doing and what they are deciding to do, whether they're here or not. And, and of course, and tourism. In New, and in yeah. New Orleans, really, I think most of the eggs are in the tourism basket. Mm -hmm. They just are. You can look around and see what's going on with real estate. That's right. where the city has mm -hmm. focused almost all I remember the kid having relatives um, that were moving from New Orleans. And I said, where are you moving to? And he said, Bonneville Boulevard. I said, <laughs> I said Bonneville Boulevard, what's that, okay? I mean, I mean, that was like some far out post at the time. But that's part of the story, too, with the whole suburban boom. And yeah. all. Okay, well, we got to move on. Let's go on over to Norm now and taking a look at politics over the Oh, one. yeah. <laughs> the bane of our existence, yeah. politics. Uh, so certainly, you know, you were going to address the, you know, the, the Duke Edwards um, uh, contest, which brought us uh, a lot of nail biting, and that's for sure, but also a really great bumper sticker. Vote for the crook, because it's important. Oh yeah, but there was one other bumper sticker that that also brought some humor to the uh, discussion. That was, vote for the lizard, not the wizard. <laughs> ah, that's a good one too. So tell us about that, that Duke Edwards contest. Well, you know, uh, it was it was uh, an election that that brought us a lot of national and international attention because of the the controversy that uh, that it produced and the, it was controversial because well once Edwards was considered by some to be a scoundrel and and Duke was the former uh, leader of the Ku Klux Klan the Grand Wizard and he had ties to white supremacists and 
he had ties to the, the Nazis. Um, and, of course, that generated a lot of flashpoints in not only the, the, the community of Louisiana, but the community around the, the nation and, and the world. Even President uh, George Herbert Walker Bush got involved. He, he, de he denounced uh, David Duke in a, in a uh, public address um, when asked. He called Duke uh, insincere, a charlatan, um, you know, an imposter. Uh, someone that that the uh, the nation couldn't afford, you know, to to have representing any part of America, and um, it was a dirty election in that uh, both sides were casting aspersions, uh, one at the at the other. But things came to a head in the 1991 debate. I think that was in uh, October, 1991. There was a debate, a statewide debate in which um, I asked Duke some very pointed questions that, that people kind of took exception to, that some people took. His supporters <laughs> yeah, took his, exception his, to. His supporters took exception to. Um, and it generated a lot of, of pushback all over the world. Uh, I have friends in, in the uh, journalism business <laughs> in Paris call me and said, well, what's going on in mm, America? Yeah. And I had the, the, the president whom I had come to know George Herbert Walker Bush, the old man, when I was a White House correspondent for CBS, I'd come to know him, and he sent word to um, one of uh, one of of Edwards's lieutenants to tell Norm to, to back off because I don't want this to to backfire on him, because there were a lot of Duke supporters who who went after me for asking him pointed questions about his his racist uh, Who was philosophy. one of the questions? One of the the questions was. <clears throat> Uh, why would any African American or Jew um, be comfortable with you in office after you said that the only thing that that African Americans contributed to American society was was less than what a mule um, had contributed, and that all Jews belong in the ash band of history? I asked that question, which was, <laughs> you know which was not comfortable for him. <laughs> and he said, I don't think, he said, I don't think you're being fair to me. And I said, I don't think you're being very honest. Well, you thought uh, you had a responsibility <laughs> to make sure people knew who this uh, man was. Of, of course. As a journalist, I have right. the responsibility of asking probing questions. So he could have said really he had very, changed, but he just yeah. It was, it was maybe a turning point. It was a very, very important was a, time in our, in our nation's could, history as well as our state's yeah. history. Yeah. And, and, of course, we're going to have to move on with this conversation. But, of course, Edwin went on to win. Yeah, he won by a landslide, 61% uh, yeah. to Duke's 39%. And then Edwin served how many more times after that? I think twice. And then, of course, yeah. he also together. served time yeah. in, in, yeah. in federal prison. <laughs> yeah. um, and it's it's passed. But that was absolutely a very heated and colorful time. You could cut the tension with a knife. Yeah, absolutely, in yeah. Louisiana history. Okay, Norm, <laughs> thanks. And, and another... Oh, gosh, so many important, crucial times in, over these past 40 years, but certainly Katrina. What Katrina did to us and what right. Katrina brought to us in terms of change. And really, to the, anyone over the age of 25, Katrina remains that line oh. in history that you, you think anything that happens now, was that before Katrina or is that after Katrina? Or after Katrina. Katrina. You know, and many of us still think along those terms. Uh, August 2005, we all went through seeing this tropical depression form on August 23rd, move through the Caribbean, kind of cross over as a Category 1 over Florida and get in the Gulf and become a monster Category 5 hurricane. Uh, 185 mile an hour sustained winds in the Gulf of Mexico. And the National Hurricane Center had released track after track after track showing it was going to the Florida Panhandle. And Louisiana, the Friday before it hit on a Sunday, was not even in the cone of error. And I remember vividly at 4 o'clock on that Friday afternoon, my beeper <laughs> went off. Mm. We put ourselves in a historical reference. Mm -hmm. And it's, everyone was beeping me. And I ran to a phone. I'm like, what is going on? What is going on? They said, well, the Hurricane Center's changed the forecast track for Katrina. It's now coming to New Orleans. They had shifted it 150 miles just two days before the expected landfall. And it was a Friday night. Oh, I mean, yeah. You know, and, and even remember. more than at noon on Friday, so many people in New Orleans, they were done. 
Right. They were Out. off. They were off. There was a Saints preseason game oh, in the yeah. Superdome. There was high school football. The weather was beautiful. So all these activities and things going on. So, and this was before, really before there was no smartphones. Then we had most of us had never sent a text message right. at that point. Exactly. It came ashore as a Cat Three, but still had a surge of a Category 5. It wiped out coastal communities completely from Mississippi mm -hmm. through Plaquemines and St. Bernard into New Orleans East. The lev levees failed. The flood protection was inadequate. 80% of New Orleans went underwater. The death toll, we should not forget mm -hmm. to mention that, um, staggering with some 1,800 people killed. Uh, the most expensive storm until that date ever uh, with billions of dollars in damage today. Uh, the region, as of 2021, regained its pre-Katrina population. The city still has not and may never not. Mm -hmm. um, we, we, you know, we were nearly 450,000 people before Katrina. Now the city of New Orleans is about 370,000. Yeah. Uh, but we've seen the shift in the population. The North Shore has boomed. Right. The coastal communities and the city have shrunk. But on the bright side, Tourism in 2019 surpassed pre-Katrina levels. Mm -hmm. The pandemic took a hit on that, but now they're expecting record tourism again this year. So people are coming back at least to visit, if not to live. We still have blight everywhere you look. You can find buildings. The police headquarters, we heard, still has mold from Katrina yeah. in it, along mm -hmm. with rats eating drugs. So that's another story uh, mm -hmm. at the police headquarters. Um, but you don't have to look far to find blight. But you also don't have to look far to find really encouraging development that has taken place in some of the neighborhoods and communities that were destroyed in But a lot and of the, the locals on, can't live here. Well, that's because true. Because of too. the expenses. But the, the impact the, on, of, on public education, right. I mean, it totally remade the, the map there. And public the health, too. Mm -hmm. for, Charity for better and worse, yeah. but, yeah. but a lot of better in that respect. Yeah, and we're still waiting to see. I, the charter school experiment did spread nationwide. New Orleans got a lot of attention for reinventing education. But the numbers haven't bared out much better than pre-Katrina, and now we're starting to see more Back traditional to schools and, starting to be and of, discussed and formed. Of course, the metro region, too, more protected now with the billions of dollars that went into the risk reduction system. Stronger mm -hmm. levees, a, right, higher exactly. walls, better floodgates, closing the hurricane highway of the Mr. Go. So far, we've passed every test. We'll see. Well, yes, and also then the state also planning, uh, you know, its coastal master plan, trying to restore and protect our coast so that we are naturally protected to the best that we can possibly mm -hmm. be at this point. Uh, what a time. Huh? What a time. Yeah. Okay, another what a time, but in a good way, is <laughs> the Saints won the Super Bowl. <laughs> Unbelievable. Oh, uh, yeah. Take you know, alone. You know, I, 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 I <laughs> never saw this. All these years on this show, I used to wonder, what if the Saints ever got in the Super Bowl? You know, we're, we're on a Friday. The Super Bowl is Sunday. Okay. What would we do that Friday? Would we do the whole show on the Saints? Okay. And in my mind, I never thought about I said, yeah, we'd probably do the whole show on the Saints. Well, if it turns out the, um, the day after the Saints Super Bowl or, or, or the day before was the city election in New Orleans. Right. That was when the Mitch Landry was elected. So that Friday, we really had to talk about politics. <laughs> so we talked about the council races and the mayor's election, and maybe we did like five minutes on the <laughs> Saints. And so, I was a, but it was, a, it, was, it was a big weekend. You know, from the time that the, uh, the Saints got into the Super Bowl to the time of the Super Bowl, and then to the time of Mardi Gras, it was maybe on the month and a half, two months, and the city was like, everybody was happy. It was like a mood that you'd never seen. Everybody was really thrilled. Mm. You know, in Mardi Gras, people would dress like Super Bowl. <laughs> right. yeah. I mean, that was a big thing. And we had the Saints victory parade. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. oh, that, that was Mardi really Gras. big. Well, yeah. let me tell you about the parade. I went to the, if you remember that day, people went home early. I mean, you know, employees let the people go early because of such big crowds. I was on St. Charles Avenue, um, uh, kind of like by Lafayette Square, and I was sitting, I was standing in the front on the curb. And this lady comes up to me with her son, and she says, would you mind letting him get in front of you? He's been waiting here for two hours. And I said, okay. But I thought to myself, I wish I'd said, I've been waiting here for 40 years. <laughs> 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 you know, same thing. Um, and, the, uh, yeah, and the parade came, but pe people were just so euphoric. But, but I remember that game had one of the all-time big plays, maybe in football history. To start the second half, there was a famous onside kick. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah where the Saints went to kick off to Indianapolis, Indianapolis to get the ball. Instead, nobody ever heard of doing an onside kick to start a half. They did the onside kick. It was successful. Saints got the ball, and they went on to win a touchdown. People always talked about that. Okay, 
many weeks later. And they were trailing going into yeah, the second yeah, half. Yeah, that, was the, that was the turning And that point. turned again. I mean, that was just a huge decision. Many weeks ago, later, the Saints, as happens now, went to the White House to meet the president, who was Obama. You know, Obama tells Sean Payton, he says, you know, as president, I've got to make a lot of tough decisions. But that decision to do the onside <laughs> kick, <laughs> you know, was one of the toughest decisions I've ever seen. Okay, guys. Uh, <laughs> well, we could go on talking for another, what, two hours or so, but we don't have that time. We so don't. we're going to have to wrap it up I'm right now. Shocked. So I'm going to ask each of you guys, just in about 15 seconds or so, the significant person that jumps out to you over these past 40 years. Well, one of the many is Tom Benson. Um, that Tom Benson really, during Katrina, felt a lot of pressure, I think of internal pressure, to move the team. And the uh, NFL, Paul Tagliabue, the commissioner, was insistent that he wouldn't. But he kept the team, ultimately. Right. He built the championship team. And then also, he came in and bought the... Uh, well, within the Charlotte Hornets and the Pelicans, right. and I think he made that that franchise stable. And then all the other things, like his his cancer and all the other public work, he's, he's been a, really been Did an important person. Did so much person. for this community, right? Okay, Steph. Ron Foreman, head of the Audubon Institute, mm -hmm. who who grew that institution into such an important tourist attraction, local attraction. And we talked about opening up the riverfront, what the aquarium did, Woldenburg Park, and now with the wharves on Esplanade and Governor Nichols Street that are going to connect riverfront promenade for two and a half miles. Yeah. That, that's huge. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Norm, over to you. Quick. Dutch Moriel, the first African-American mayor of the city of New Orleans, the ultimate statesman, was able to pull the whole city together, including the New Orleans, the irascible New Orleans City Council, uh, during the police strike in 1979, and uh, keep things uh, afloat even when we had no Mardi Gras. <laughs> well, we had no parades. We had Mardi Gras. We always have right. Mardi Gras floats or not. But that's my choice. That's no, my that's my historic person of notation. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Patrick Taylor, without him and being the architect of the scholarship program that he began for the state of Louisiana, tens of thousands of young pe people right. never would have gone to college. Absolutely. Uh, just a huge impact. Mm -hmm. um, thanks, guys, for this wonderful discussion here. And also, um, I want to thank the reporters over 40 years who have been here around this table or another setting, um, just informing our community more about the, the news of the day. I want to thank Errol also for just, you know, making sure that the program was on time, on track, with the people that needed to be here. And we also want to acknowledge two of the previous hosts of the show, Warren Bell, who sat in this chair from 1985 to 1987, and the late Larry Lorenz, who hosted the program for 26 years. And, of course, I want to thank our viewing audience. You guys have supported us for 40 years. You keep saying how much you really enjoy it and how, think, how you think it's so important for the community. Well, we intend to be here for maybe another 40 years plus. Well, thank Sound you. Like, maybe <laughs> yeah. not exactly. You pull around this table. But WYS will continue to bring you informed sources every Friday. So be looking for us. And be looking for us this coming Friday. And we will celebrate now with some champagne and this beautiful cake from Swiss Confectionery. Thanks so much for watching. Have a good evening. Informed Sources is made possible in part by Susie and Pierre G. Villery. Public television is our passion. With so much content that WYES broadcasts and presents online, we are quite entertained and highly informed. Please join us in supporting WYES. This program is brought to you in part by the Eugenie and Joseph Jones Family Foundation, a local foundation proud to support education, the arts, and culture in the greater New Orleans area.